Adhikarana 7. Acquisition of Divine Powers Doubt. Do those people who attain union with God while still having minds acquire unlimited or limited divine powers as a result of meditation on the qualified Brahman? What should be the conclusion? Opponent. Their divine power should be without any limitation, as is obvious from the Upanishadic texts. He himself gets independent sovereignty. Taittiriya Upanishad 162. All the gods carry presence to him. Taittiriya 153. They get freedom of movement in all the worlds. Chandogya 816-725-2. To this, the aphorist replies, Sutra 17, Jagadvyaparavarjam prakaranadasanihitatvacha. The released soul gets all the divine powers. Jagadvyaparavarjam, barring the power of running this universe, as is known, Prakaranat, from the context, cha, and asanihitatvacha, from non-contiguity. Translation. The realized soul gets all the divine powers except that of running the universe with its creation, continuance, and dissolution, as is known from the context, which deals with God, and from the non-proximity of the individual soul. It is proper that, barring the power of creation, etc., of the universe, the liberated souls should have all the other divine powers, like becoming very minute, etc. The power, however, of creation, etc., of the universe can reasonably belong to God alone, who exists eternally. Why should it be so? Since God forms the subject matter of that topic, the others being far from being considered there. For the Supreme Lord alone has competence for activities concerning the creation, etc., of the universe, inasmuch as the fact of creation, etc., is taught in connection with him alone, and the word eternal is attributed to him. The Upanishads mention that others get the divine powers of becoming atomic in size, etc., as a result of search and hankering for knowing him. Thus, they are remotely placed from the activities connected with creation, etc., of the universe. Moreover, from the very fact that the liberated souls are equipped with minds, they cannot have any unanimity, so that someone may at one time want the continuance of the universe and someone else its destruction. In this way, they may at times be opposed to one another. If, then, one should seek a reconciliation by making all the other wills dependent on one will only, then that reconciler will perforce arrive at the conclusion that all other wills are dependent on God's will alone. Sutra 18 Pratyakshopadeshaditi chenadikarika mandalastokte the powers of the liberated soul are unlimited, pratyaksha upadeshat, owing to direct scriptural declaration. Itichet, if this be the objection, then na, not so. Adhikarika mandalasta uptehe. Since it is the attainment of him, that is, God, who appoints others as lords of the spheres and resides in those spheres that is spoken of. Translation. If it be held that the powers of the liberated soul are unlimited owing to direct scriptural declaration, then it is not so, 
since it is the attainment of him, that is God, who appoints others as lords of the spheres and resides in those spheres that is spoken of in the Upanishad. The statement was made earlier that from such direct teaching as he himself gets independent sovereignty, Kaitriya 162, it is but reasonable to conclude that the liberated souls get unfettered divine powers. That has to be refuted. As to that, it is said that this is nothing damaging, since it is God appointing others to their respective spheres and himself residing in those spheres that is spoken of in the Upanishad. It is declared that this bestowing of independent sovereignty is at the disposal of God, who ordains others to be the rulers of particular spheres and who resides in such special abodes as the orb of the sun. It is because of this that a little later the Upanishad says, He attains the Lord of the mind, Taitariya 162, which amounts to saying that he attains God, who is the Lord of all minds, and who is ever present there as the pre-existing reality. It is in line with this that the Upanishad says still later, He becomes the ruler of speech, the ruler of eyes, the ruler of ears, the ruler of knowledge, Ibidam. Thus, in other places also, the texts are to be construed as far as possible to mean that their divine powers are attained at the behest of God alone, who exists eternally. Namaste. So there are two types of mystic powers. Uh, ordinary mystic powers in the material universe and those of the realized souls in the Brahma Loka. What's the difference? In the material world, yogis and sometimes even demons can get these mystic powers like lagima and manima and so on, but the ability to become tiny <laughs> like an atom or as big as a planet or whatever, and so many others. But they can use them according to their own will, which can be against the will of God. I mean, there are so many stories in the Puranas about great demons. Well, like Ravana. Ravana had extensive mystic powers granted by Shiva, but then he used them or misused them against Rama, who is an incarnation and, of course, he was destroyed. So, this is the thing. Within the material universe, these powers also come at a cost. They're karmic in nature, and like everything karmic, they can be exhausted. One gets, you know, a particular number of uses <laughs> or a particular amount of use of a mystical power, and then when it's used up, it goes away. And there's a nice uh, story about, I think it was Karna, in the uh, Mahabharata War, the Battle of Kurukshetra. He was cursed that when he most needs his mystic powers, that they will fail. And this is always the case, isn't it? We see demoniac people in the material world, uh, they typically overextend their powers. And then, just when they're relying on their powers the most, they fail. They have that developed confidence in those powers, and they're dependent on them to keep their position. So when the karma is used up, they become like ordinary people again, and so they can be defeated. But in the spiritual world, all these powers are in accordance with the will of God. How do we know this? Well, you don't get into the spiritual world unless your will is in accordance with the will of God, in harmony with the will of God. I mean, just imagine, you know, if you're a rich person and you have an exclusive club, 
you're not going to let anybody in who doesn't agree with your views or with your style or whatever your criteria are. In the same way, you're not going to be able to enter the spiritual world unless your heart and mind are already aligned with God. So, and, and of course, you also have to have developed love of God. So there are so many criteria for entering the spiritual world. I mean, these are just preliminary. After that purification of the heart and so forth, then you have to realize Brahman. And those who try to realize Brahman without purification of the heart and mind fall down. They can't realize it. They can pretend. Huh? And there are some very good actors out there, some very good pretenders who claim to have realized Brahman. But then when we see their activities, they're no different from ordinary people. Oh, I could tell so many stories. <laughs> but I won't. Because you know this from your own experience. You approach a person who advertises themselves as a holy man or a guru. And uh, from the outside, everything looks good. But then once you get close to them, you find out actually they're still engaging in mundane activities and so on. Nasty activities. So this is not the kind of person who can make it into the spiritual world. The pretentious, the phonies. Uh, you have to actually purify your heart and mind. That's why we advise everyone over and over again to do sadhana, to chant your mantra, to do your rituals according to the scriptures that describe the worship of whatever form of God that appeals to you. So that purifies your heart of any extraneous desires that are not part of the will of God, that are against or disharmonious with the will of God. That's the only way you're going to get into Brahmaloka. Because even if you don't have any mystic powers, uh, for example, we, we really have no interest in mystic powers. They are a distraction on the path. Because within this world, mystic powers almost always lead to misuse or overuse or dependence. And we don't want that. In fact, from our point of view, the alignment of one's heart and mind with the will of God is far more important than any knowledge or powers that one could develop by means of sadhana. Yeah, you can develop those things, but you have to do very difficult tapasya for a long time to get them. Now, why don't you do that tapasya to realize God instead? That would be such a better use of the time and energy you have to put into it. So this is our message to everyone who wants to actually realize the truth. Don't get caught up in mystic powers or imposing your will on others or building any kind of structures in the material world you know, whether physical structures or social structures or intellectual structures, you know, they might be a temporary help in some stages of the path. Like, it's very good to know ontology and be able to analyze the scriptures. And we'll talk about this in another video. What you really want to do is to do your sadhana with the intention to purify your heart and mind and bring it into total harmony with the will of God. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>